Uh, let's go first to listen to, uh, to our last speaker of this panel, that's Kirsten Berg. He's also playing a home uh, uh, match here. Uh, he's from the University of, uh, of, of Groningen. Uh, finishing a book, not just not yet published, but uh, he, he still has to finish it because it is his PhD, which he is in the final stages of writing, and uh, then it still has to be approved and defended and then published. But it, <coughs> I'm sure it will, uh, will happen in, in, in later this year. Um, so, uh, Case is, uh, is specializing in the field of international investment law, especially in the context of uh, uh, the uh, energy investment, uh, energy charter treaty, uh, and uh, related to that, the issue of uh, investment in renewable energy. Uh, that is not a topic of your talk today, but today you talk about uh, damages, damaging, damages which will be awarded in, in such investment uh, arbitration cases and the differences. Thank you very much, uh, Marcel. For you have the ten minutes past, or a bit more, eleven minutes past, so you keep an eye on the ball. I, I will. <laughs> Thank you for the kind introduction, and it's great to hear that you have so much confidence in uh, finishing my uh, my PhD. And also, thank you, panels, for the invitation. Uh, today, I am going to talk about the quantification of damages in energy-related investment arbitrations. Uh, why is it interesting? Well, because it's the the, the question to the million. Uh, well, yeah, the answer holds to the million dollar question or more likely an energy dispute sometimes, the billion dollar uh, question. Yeah, think of the following. Earlier this century, the Russian Federation essentially nationalized the Yugos oil company, gave rise to countless of legal proceedings all over the world, including one, Yugos brought a dispute before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, the U European Court of Human Rights indeed established that the, the Human Rights Convention had been violated awarded just a satisfaction to the Yukos oil company of two billion uh, US dollars or, or euros. Uh, quite a significant award for that specific court, but take into account that the majority shareholders of Yukos, which merely held 60% of the shares in Yukos that obtained two billion, <coughs> they obtained 50 billion US dollars in an ECT arbitration. Now why so much more in ECT arbitration? Well, uh, I don't know exactly, but it might have something to do with the fact that usually investment treaties are dead silent on issues of state liability, responsibility, damages, etc. Therefore, customary international law applies. Specifically, you have to look at the ILC draft article. So this is, I would say, an area of, of customary international law that has been codified quite extensively. Um, particularly before diving into awards that I will analyze, um, what are the relevant rules? Well. The first relevant rule is that uh, <coughs> reparation should be provided, Article 31. Article 35 goes on about restitution, for example, and that, that uh, the purpose is to re-establish the situation which existed before the wrongful act was committed, and then Article 36 is about uh, compensation. Also very important in this regard is an almost century-old judgment of the Permanent Court of International Justice in the Factory at Corso case. If you look at the ILC draft articles, reference to this specific judgment is made quite often, and also in contemporary investment arbitration, it pops up, pops up quite often. And in particular, I don't know if I have a laser on this thing. Uh, yeah, oh, it doesn't show. The thing in italics, at least in the middle. So reparation must, as far as possible, and that's I think the purpose of reparation in international law, wipe out all the consequences of the illegal act and re-establish <coughs> the situation which would in all probability have existed if that act had not been committed. Now, one ECT arbitration referred to this statement as sort of setting out the purpose of reparation in international law, and of course, that might be considered as a yeah, teleological interpretation tool. <coughs> um, so, this, these are the rules, and I think, relatively speaking, they are sometimes contested in, in, in international investment arbitration, but I think it's a widely held view that these are indeed the applicable rules. So, to the, their application in ECT arbitration, what I did is I looked at the awards uh, where a violation of the treaty had been established, and I, then I started just reading what the tribunals did and how they give content to full reparation or full compensation. What, what does this mean? What does this require? Uh, 15 awards, 17 cases in total. UCOS cases was three cases, but I, I'm going to refer to it as one. Um, and I'm primarily going to limit myself, I stole this picture from the presentation given la last week by the people involved in the, the Tricky Law Project. 
so what I will do is very briefly look at identification of the, of the rule of customary international law and subsequently look at its interpretation. Uh, but some tribunals just do something, it seems like. Of course, investment law, dispute settlement takes place through ad hoc arbitration, and in particular, I think also in the context of ECT arbitration, inconsistencies are all over the place. Uh, so keep that in mind. Of course, arbitration is an adversarial process, so it's also quite important what the parties argue. Um, yeah, so one case, Energo Alliance versus Moldova, breach of the treaty had been established, and well, when discussing damages, there was pretty much no reference to any applicable treaty standard. There is none, of course. No reference to customary international law, no reference to factory at Corso case, or anything of the kind, just a number. So that's one way to, to quantify damages. <laughs> But, by and large, I must say, and I was a bit surprised, um, most other tribunals yeah, often adopt a comparable pattern. So, first of all, they say, well, we have established violation of the treaty, the treaty doesn't say what we should do now, therefore we look at customary international law. These are the cases, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9, so quite a few case, uh, cases the tribunals did that. Subsequently, they refer to full reparation, uh, Article 31 of the ILC draft articles, um, sometimes also by general reference to the Corso Factory case, I suppose that's also <coughs> reference to full reparation. So this is the norm. Sometimes the other norms are also referred to in these cases, in particular Article 36 is about monetary compensation is being referred to. Some of the older cases, reference was also made to Article 35, but I think nowadays it's a quite widely held view by investment tribunals that if the treaty has been violated, monetary compensation should be provided for because awarding anything else would uh, infringe on the state's right to regulate, which Emily discussed earlier. So, having identified the rules, how are they then subsequently interpreted? And the main question is, of course, look, the things that I was looking for is, you know, what does full reparation mean and how do tribunals address this question? Uh, Again, very briefly because it is quite important, reference to factory at Corso, at Corso uh, reparation must, as far as possible, wipe out all the consequences of the illegal act and re-establish the situation which would, in all probability, have existed in, uh, if that act had not been committed. I, as I already said, consider that this is a reference to the purpose of the norm uh, and quite a few tribunals in particular uh, Quite recent cases, uh, this was the first reference to what uh, full reparation means. Then there were also some other statements. Uh, for example, two ECT tribunals referred to a quote uh, from the tribunal, it was a BIT arbitration in Vivendi versus Argentina, slightly older case, and namely based on these principles, which are those pronounced in the uh, factory at Norso case, and absent limiting terms in the relevant treaty. It is generally accepted today that regardless of the type of investment and regardless of the nature of the illegitimate measure, the level of damages awarded, it's in italics, in international investment arbitration is supposed to be sufficient to compensate the affected party fully and to eliminate the consequences of the state's action. I think, again, reference to, uh, to well, the purpose of the specific norm. Uh, well, a spoiler alert, everything is pretty much reference to purpose, I would say. Yeah, for example, in Green Tech versus Italy, very recent case, um, there was an interesting one because um, Italy argued that, that uh, here you see their reparation must as far as possible. Uh, the argument of, <coughs> of Italy was essentially uh, Italy acknowledged the, the, the general validity of the principle of full compensation, but it contended that the phrase as far as possible which is part of the principle, limits its effect and refers to the discretionary power of international tribunals to assess the circumstances of the case. And in this case, the, the, the measures introduced by Italy that violated the ECT were really, they, they, they served the public goal, etc., etc. They were not horrible measures comparable, for example, to what happened in Newcastle. The tribunal <coughs> did not agree, though. Uh, Quite to the contrary, it held that that phrase means that a tribunal must do whatever it can to ensure that full compensation is granted and the injured party is made whole again. So perhaps it all, not just purpose, but also a bit of effectiveness. Must do whatever it can. And then, Antin versus Spain. Um, 
the, the purpose of full reparation is to remove the consequences of the, of the wrongful act. Very much comparable uh, in Nassar versus Spain, also a quite recent case, uh, full compensation requires putting an investor into a position that would have existed but for the breach. Um, also, full reparation in very similar vein. Again, full reparation standard is intended to put the injured party in the position in which it would have found itself but for the wrongful act. Um, again, in a similar vein, Nova Energia versus Spain. The principle of full reparation under customary international law therefore dictates that the aggrieved <coughs> investor shall through monetary compensation be placed in the same situation it would have been but for the breaches of the state's international law obligations. Um, yeah, more of the same, essentially full reparation <coughs> purpose is to remove the consequences of the wrongful act. Uh, so, I think to conclude, uh, most tribunals interpret it in a way which emphasizes the purpose of the measure, which is to make the investor whole again. So essentially, you have to compare two situations. One situation where the, the, the state did violate the treaty and a hypothetical situation where it would not have violated the treaty and the difference between those two situations is full reparation. Um, so I think that's reference to purpose. Uh, you could also have achieved, I think, the same goal by a more of a grammatical interpretation of fool by looking at the Oxford Dictionary, what it means, but I did not find a single reference to that, so they don't really seem to do that. Uh, but perhaps what is good to keep in mind in, in this regard is that, first of all, I think the norm, the relevant norm here is, is yeah, it, it, it's well established, it is contested, but those, uh, those arguments are usually quite quickly dismissed. Um, and what perhaps may also play a role, and perhaps that's more, if I go back a little bit, if you look at these dates, particularly the recent ones, um, in quite a few of the ECT arbitrations, uh, investors are represented by a, a relatively small group of, of law firms, and perhaps because it's an adversarial process and they tend to submit, well, the same line of reasoning in, in various cases that may lead to this outcome. But I do not know that because you usually do not have access to, to, to the memorandums. Um, so I think that, that that's all that I wanted to add to uh, today. Thank you very much for your attention.